Hello. Thanks for joining me. Uh, welcome to Sparking Curiosity Driven Exploration Through Narrative and Outer Wilds. I'm very obviously Kelsey Beecham. I'm a writer and narrative designer, and I actually started my games career with Outer Wilds, uh, specifically as a contractor for Mobius Digital. These days, I'm a narrative designer at Obsidian Entertainment. Uh, just a quick mention before we get going here, I don't re represent either of those studios. My thoughts are my own. Please do not steal them. I only have so many. Um, so today we're going to be talking specifically about Outer Wilds. Outer Wilds uh, is a weird little project that happened. Uh, back in 2012, we began as my brother Alex Beecham's master's thesis at University of Southern California. And in hmm, 2013, we were in the uh, university showcase. And then after that point, we kind of just kept developing it for fun. Um, and then in 2015, some very good stuff happened for us, and we won Seamus McNally at the Independent Games Festival, as well as Best in Design. And then later that year, we were picked up by Mobius Digital uh, to continue development. And then eventually, in 2019, we launched. And I bring this up because Outer Wilds, probably because of its origin as a thesis, thesis project, has some very specific design goals to it. Uh, and some very particular things that we were trying to accomplish. So what I'd like to do is break down Narrative's role in supporting Outer Wilds' unique design goals uh, and bring up examples of what worked for us and why. And uh, we're going to have fun. Before we do, though, uh, this talk does contain spoilers. I'm very sorry. Our fans have a saying that talking about Outer Wilds is spoilers. They are not wrong. It is impossible to talk about this game without spoiling it at least a little. So you've been warned. Um, if you are thinking of playing this game, I would recommend like pausing the video and just coming back to it later after you've uh, finished the game. I'll be here. For the rest of you, uh, Outer Wilds is an open world space exploration game, adventure slash narrative mystery. We're often described as alien NASA meets backpacking in space, which is pretty fun. Uh, and the fun bit about the solar system is that it is caught in a time loop. And throughout that time loop of uh, 22 minutes, the planets and celestial bodies are changing over time, which affects where you can explore. Um, you start out as a Harthian on the planet Timber Hearth, and you're part of this space program, and it's your first uh, solo launch. So it's launch day. That's all fun and exciting. You have to get launch codes from ground control, but that's it. Uh, that's the only thing we really make you do. And then from there, you're sent off into space to freely explore the world as you see fit. Um, one thing you are encountering up there uh, is you're discovering ruins and writing left behind by this ancient alien species called the Nomai. And you're using that to piece together the world's mysteries. Um, after 22 minutes, the sun explodes, killing the player uh, and resetting everything to the beginning of that time loop. But at its simplest, Outer Wilds is a game about finding answers to questions about the world around you. To that end, let's talk about major design goals really quickly. So from my brother's thesis paper, uh, Outer Wilds is a space exploration game designed to inspire and reward player curiosity. Pretty straightforward, allegedly. Uh, the goal here being create a game that rewards curiosity-driven exploration. Easy enough. So here, for us, that means the player is, they have questions about the world around them, and they want those questions answered, so they're taking action to find those answers, aka exploring. Uh, basically, it starts with a question, usually, what's there, what is it, what is it like up close, and it drives the player toward discovering an answer. Hopefully an answer they like. Curiosity is Outer Wilds' driving force, and it is Outer Wilds' sole driving force. Um, there are no missions, assigned objectives, any kind of prescriptive guidelines that you have to follow. We're not telling the player what to do. It's entirely self-guided. Well, almost entirely. Knowledge is also kind of the only gameplay reward. We don't have those other feedback loops of 
point scoring or uh, you know completing something at a set time or anything competitive multiplayer. So we really needed our players to like knowledge an awful lot. Um, also, knowledge is how you progress in the game. So obviously, this is really important for us. Um, here's a summary of that, if you needed it. But point being, uh, we're very serious about knowledge being the big reward here. Um, and we did realize going in, yeah, that's going to alienate certain player types, uh, specifically these ones. But that's okay. Uh, giving everything we had for this very particular type of player actually let us create this really, really compelling experience for them. And I don't know, I, I think that was worth, worth embracing. Uh, okay, okay, so said a lot of good things. Let's, let's talk about what this actually looks like. So if our gameplay loop is at its core inspiring curiosity and then rewarding the player for acting on that curiosity, this is what we're kind of looking at here. And for narrative, um, my role in that can be either one of those things. So the player will become curious about something, say, you know, the anglerfish at the museum. And then hopefully the player acts on their curiosity. And in this case, they're going to walk up, see the anglerfish, read the plaque, all that good stuff, and be rewarded with knowledge, which is, hey, it's an anglerfish. Um, and from there, our player is going to hopefully be curious and explore and remember, oh, like Dark Bramble, I saw a baby anglerfish at the museum. Well, you saw an anglerfish at the museum. I'm sorry about this. Um, this, I want to bring up, doesn't just apply to narrative. Uh, because knowledge does not only come in this game in written form. Um, if you're investigating a cave, uh, the, the reward here is, of course, not that death. It's, it's that knowledge that the cave fills up with sand. You're learning something about how the cave works. Um, and that's progress because it's helping us learn how to navigate that cave space. Now we can travel further inside safely. We can learn what's, what's in there. Uh, where we're also we're going to discover new things to be curious about. Um, for example, the Sunless City and all the ruins in there. So it's also worth pointing out that the knowledge that we're giving players as a reward is not always the knowledge they were looking for, because presumably you did not run into that cave looking for death. Um, it's just it's enough to kind of progress along that path and help us get in the right direction, even if it's not the answer right away. So. I bring all of this up because our main overall design goals have a huge impact on story. Uh, it determines story type and structure, and it also determines what our narrative goals are. Um, so if we want a maximally nonlinear gameplay experience that inspires curiosity in the player, enables free exploration, and rewards them for exploring, we're looking at a mystery first off, right? Complex enough to motivate the player for the the entire game because we don't want that to fall apart and we want them to be invested in the world and what's happening to it because without that player investment why are you playing the game uh free exploration means no gating it means nothing is off limits and it means that we don't want a story that is impossible to keep track of even though it needs to be complex um we also want mysteries that pay off regularly with satisfying answers we want the overall story itself to be very rewarding and we want that story to kind of push players forward, get them to, you know, ask, oh, what happens next and want to learn that. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> so we're going to simplify it a little bit. Um, generally, any narrative design choices we made on the project ultimately falls under one of these kind of three broad goals. Uh, inspire curiosity, facilitate exploration, or reward exploration. Um, often, a narrative designer of story choice is accomplishing more than one of those goals at the same time, which made structuring this talk a little tricky, let me tell you. But let's start with this first one. So step one, how do we make the player curious? Write a really good story. Um, that's it, that's the talk. No, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm just like this. Uh, basically, Outer Wild's story is a sprawling mystery. Um, or 
it's kind of made up a, a ton of little mysteries that all kind of add together to make this sprawling mystery, but we'll talk about structure a little more later. Um, there's the mystery of what's happening in the solar system. You have planets that are changing, you have the sun exploding, you're caught in a time loop, and we don't know why that's all going on. And then we also have the mystery of the Nomai. Who were they? Where did they come from? What were they doing here? What happened to them? Um, another way to think of how we make the player curious is just how do we get the player to ask questions? Because we need them to be doing that. And that itself means we need to look at what specific questions we want the player to ask, because that's what's going to guide our player's journey. Uh, we started with four initial major questions when we were developing story. And I keep saying we, and that would be the creative director, Alex Beecham, and the lead designer, Loan Bruneau. Um, so we looked at these four major questions, and each one of them is a major storyline or mystery thread in the game. Um, and a cool thing about this is that early on in the game, you'll find content that connects to those mysteries in some way, even if you don't necessarily, as the player, know that right off the bat. Um, and what you're going to find with each one of these examples is they're big, exciting events, and we're showing them to you rather than telling you about them. Um, for example, the uh, the alien statue, the Nomai statue in the museum, uh, when you come out to head off into space, uh, actually you get frozen in place temporarily and it turns toward you and its eyes glow and it activates and it starts syncing up with your memories. That's huge. And that is a really good way for us to pull the player into the Know My Story rather than just saying, uh, hey, here's some text you can read, huh? huh? Um, quick pop quiz on that one. Which of these is more exciting as a player experience? Uh, me telling you that there are cyclones on Giant's Deep, pretty cool, or or this, um, yeah. Basically, it's these physical processes and locations that grab the player's attention, and it's leading them to investigate whatever it is that has grabbed their attention. Um, and usually, what happens is, for example, with the cyclones, uh, you get sucked in quite literally. <laughs> Uh, boy, I didn't think I was going to make that joke. Um, but you get pulled in, and then you're on Giant's Deep, and you're interacting with the ruins there and the found text, and that sort of gets you to investigate what's happening on that planet. Um, some of the story is, in fact, I'd say a lot of that story is told through found text, but uh, it generally doesn't deliver our biggest initial hooks. It's meant to be interesting. It's designed that way, for sure. But it's not going to be as exciting as getting sucked up by a cyclone. Um, and when text does deliver a hook, it can only do so when the player chooses to interact with it. I can't push that information onto the player for the most part. We tend not to do that. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Here uh, is my, <laughs> okay, well, not a technical term, but let me talk you through this because it's a thing I think about a lot. And it's the idea of pushing information on the player versus having the player pull it. Uh, I made you a diagram. It's this thing of imagine that you've gotten out of your car and your arms are full of groceries and they're heavy and your neighbor has come up and wants to tell you all about their day and they're pushing this information about their day on you. You didn't ask, you don't want it, you're busy. In fact, there's ice cream in one of those bags and it's melting probably and now that's all you can think about. So you're not really in the ideal headspace to receive that information from your neighbor. Not great. Um, however, once you've put the ice cream inside and it's safely not melting and you've got the rest of the groceries squared away, it's not on your mind anymore, and you go out and then you ask your neighbor for this information, um, for some reason, then you are in a much better space to receive it and you're going to remember it and be more engaged with it. Uh, to that end, because there is a ton of information in Outer Wilds, um, we need to be really careful to not overwhelm the player with it. And so to try to mitigate that, what we did was we minimized how often you are forced to receive information uh, and how much information you are forced to receive that way. Um, 
a good example of kind of forced information being pushed on the player, uh, cutscenes. Cutscenes do that. They push up, you know, that info to you. Um, for us, it's limited to the very start and very end of the game. The very end of the game because it's kind of linear and we're wrapping things up. It kind of has to at some point be that. Uh, and the very beginning of the game because you do have to talk to the first, I think the first, no, gosh, is it just one? I should know this. Um, you do have to talk to at least the curator because you have to go get the launch codes. And that does have to happen so that we can then do that brief cinematic of the statue turning toward you and activating. But it's pretty minimal. Um, so what we do instead here, because we do need the player to know that information is available when they're ready for it, when they want to seek it out. So you have to signal its availability. Um, so pixing obviously is determined by player actions. Uh, it, you know, as you're going through finding know my text, for example, that's that's completely down to the player almost entirely. Um, key information is kept infinitely revisitable because we are in a time loop. Even Gabro, the uh, traveler that is in like aware of the time loop with you, um, even Gabro, you can still revisit all of those points. So you're never in a position where you think, oh boy. There's information being pushed on me. I have to remember all of this because if I, you know, if I forget, it's going to be a huge problem. Um, we're also kind of coding uh, how to find or where to find certain types of information through narrative delivery. So, really obvious example: Nomai text will always contain information about the Nomai and their story, and it's always going to provide clues about unraveling the solar system's mysteries. Um, Unvisited Know My Text is coded such that if you haven't read it before in that time loop, um, it's a different color. Found text about specific mystery threads are largely grouped kind of by physical location. So you know, if it's a small arc at least, you know kind of to check out the immediate surrounding area for more information about that. So we're trying to kind of guide the player to know where certain information is so that if they want to pull that information, they know where to do it. Um, the Travelers are a great example of this. There's one on every planet. Uh, you can easily locate them through the signal scope because they all play an instrument, so you can pick up their sound, and that makes them very easy to find, uh, and also kind of delightful. <laughs> Andrew probably did an amazing job with the music. Um, and the menu is what I want to point out here, because it's set up and it functions the same way for a lot of our travelers, where you can pull that information about, hey, you know, I don't know where to go or where to explore on this planet. Um, help me out here. That's really useful for us for players that maybe need a little more guidance, especially initially, because this is very surface level stuff that they talk about. Uh, here's an example of where I do this in text. Initially, we kind of, what's the word? Cut the player loose uh, without too much information about why they were going into space. Uh, we tried couple iterations of this. Um, and it turns out that not everyone is super comfortable with the idea of there not being a specific mission that you're meant to accomplish. Um, so eventually what we did is we landed on with Hornfels, the curator at the museum. This is the character that you do have to speak with before you can go into space. Uh, and you are given the option to, these are all on your uh, left are all of the player choices. And if you indicate that maybe you're nervous about starting out or that you're not sure where you should go, uh, we direct you someplace particular. Not because we uh, especially want to tell you what to do there either. Uh, there's quite a lot you can do at the moon, but it's gentle <laughs> and kind. It's a great place for players to get their bearings if that's something they feel they need to do first. Um, it's got a few more tutorials that are, again, entirely optional because all of our tutorials are. Uh, you can examine Nozomi ruins while you're stationary and they're not in zero G, which is a thing we do to people. Um, you're not actively being flung into space. That's nice. So uh, the Nozomi ruins here are also actually a really good entry point for something called the Eye of the Universe, which is a huge thing in our game. Um, so like that's a good a good place to guide players to in general. But again, we're not guiding them there unless they indicate that that's what they want. Um, I don't have an official metric for this, but I would say for me watching playtesting, the average time players take to really interact with Know My Text probably is anywhere from 20, 30 minutes to a few hours. Um, 
which is kind of wild, but I get it because, you know, there are all these cool things going on, all of these visually interesting things in space that you want to check out first. Um, so we don't force the players to care about the story. The story can wait until the player is good and ready. You're essentially playing an archaeologist. It's not going anywhere. It's all in the past. But I do want players to care about the story eventually. And that's where getting the player invested in it comes in. There's a lot of found texts in Outer Wilds, and we needed players to read it. Because again, that's how progression works. And since you're doing so much reading of it, it should also be fun. Uh, so I want it to be an enjoyable experience, and I want it to be something that they're willing to get invested in and care about. Um, to that end, let's talk about the Nomite for a minute here. Um, if you're not familiar with them, there are these super curious, highly advanced science nerds who used to live in the solar system, uh, and they vanished a long time ago, so that you can only find their ruins and their writing now. And the challenge of the Nomai for storytelling is that uh, they're in the past. They're, they're long gone, meaning we never see them. It is hard to get a player to care about a character that they never see. Sometimes they might as well not exist. Um, the player also can't change or, or impact the past. They can't affect the Nomai story or change what happened to them. So that's, it's, it can be a bit tricky then to get players to understand why they even should care. And yet they do need to. Uh, so one thing that took a lot of iteration here um, was the Nomai voice, but this was huge because this is what you're with for, for so much of the game. Um, honestly, I spent probably multiple years getting it right. Um, and in fairness, this was back when I was either moonlighting as a game writer or was very part-time on it. So maybe it's not years of full-time work, but still, this was a lot of iteration. Um, and it was really worth getting right. A couple of things that I want to note about it because they do, you know, might fall into a little bit of the ancient alien trope. And we did not want them to feel, I'm not gonna name drop the Chozo, but I'm actually exactly going to name drop the Chozo, um, as, much as, as much as I love Metroid Prime and all. Um, the we thing, the hive mind, the, the, those pronouns are so difficult to connect with. It is hard to connect with the group in that way. Um, I is just inherently more interesting. It feels less like a summary. It's also a little clearer that they're talking to other characters versus with we, it's like, well, who are you leaving this for? Did you know I was coming to it to explore later? Because that'd be weird. Um, another thing is we wanted it to be unique from the Harthian voice uh, because the Harthians sound a little bit more like your average humans. And we wanted the Nomai to feel a bit alien, but still be somebody or some buddies that uh, you can empathize with and connect with. Um, so that meant watching out for it feeling stilted or overly formal, which is very easy to run into with that. Um, the use of humor ended up being huge for us. And that was another thing that took some time to get the right feel for it. Eventually uh, I settled, uh, they're nerds, they make nerd jokes. Um, they're, they're, they're making bad jokes in space as they're dealing with all of these complex problems and it humanizes them in a really nice way. Because even if you're not understanding maybe like what they do about quantum macroscopic quantum mechanics or, or the intricacies of time travel, um, you're able to identify them with them in these other ways. So that was extremely useful. Um, it's emotional investing. Characters, again, because um, I talked about this a bit, but the whole I versus we thing. Uh, because the, the player does spend so much time with the Nomai um, through reading their text and reading their stories, that really, they should be, you know, characters that the player wants to spend time with. Um, humanizing them to feel more relatable and more interesting uh, just makes them so much more alive. And again, we're doing this and, and you're not seeing them. So they have to be alive as much as possible. Um, it's also, it's, it's a lot easier to connect to individuals than a big group. Um, cause a big group is kind of nebulous and a little harder to define. And an individual, I can describe, you know, a nomized personality and like what they want specifically or don't want. 
um, what their, their hopes or fears are. Harder to do with the group because it's just that much broader. Um, individuals are also nice because they give us greater variance in, in terms of content and in terms of voice. Um, they have different, you know, senses of humor. They have different personalities. Um, that ended up being really useful for keeping content consistently interesting and different. But basically, characters get us invested, and we want to see what happens to them. And that's exactly the thing that I need to have happen for the player. Um, there's another way that we persuade players to take an interest in the Know My Story, and that is how the player learns that story. Uh, specifically, it's the translator tool, which is a thing I freaking love. Uh, it's this really nice example of gameplay and narrative design just integrating really well together. Uh, and it's, it happened because uh, Alex wanted to know, hey, uh, what if you could physically interact with the text, Kelsey? Do you think that would, do you think that would change it for you? Yes. Uh, and I'll show you how, but it's a little easier to do with the video. So purple text hasn't been translated yet. You're holding a button to translate it. And you'll notice that it's branching off in two directions here because it's nonlinear. This gives the player just a little bit more control over the text than they would have if it were written linearly, which is kind of nice in a game like this. So obviously, Know My Text exists physically in the world. Uh, the translator tool is so fun because it is allowing the player to engage with the text uh, in a way that's maybe a little more exciting than you know walking up to it, pressing A. Uh, and it turns text delivery into a game mechanic, which I'm a huge nerd about. Uh, so I also got to play with language a bit as a result because we're presenting text differently than we maybe normally would, um, say like with the way we do with the Harthians. And so um, language as a result is structured non-linearly. It comes from actually the way that I take notes usually, which is just they branch off consistently and loop back around other points. Um, typically with this text, because we've talked a little bit about coding for particular information, we want the longest branch to contain the most important info. It's not always the case, it's just kind of a loose rule of thumb. And then usually it's branch endings or occasionally beginnings. Those are often going to contain kind of your actionable clue um, of what's going on, where to go next, that sort of thing. Not always, just ish. Uh, this is a very, very basic example of it because I didn't want to pull anything too crazy but you can see the way it branches off based off of topic there. So that brings us to our second narrative design goal, uh, which is facilitating exploration. Uh, here's a weird thing. I wrote Outer Wilds in-game text to fulfill highly specific design needs and obviously to support nonlinear progression. Um, every piece of text in the game, well, every piece of know my text in the game either communicates a clue uh, sets up a piece of world lore or builds on themes and characterization. Usually it's all three at once. And it's always this one, except for like a handful of flavor text that I wrote. We really didn't have a lot of space for that. So almost no text in the game is like purely for fun. Here's how this is going to work. So we have to advance story, right? We have to advance, you know, plot, uh, character, story arcs, uh, mysteries, that sort of thing. And we also need to direct the player forward uh, to where to go to continue following that story thread or get more information about it. But since we don't know when the player is hitting this piece of information, we need to also direct them to previously in the story thread. Or sometimes um, it's just to kind of the previous uh, story arc that would have tied into this one. Again, everything's really interconnected. So if we take that piece of text that I had up earlier and we break it down by this kind of 
system, this is what we end up getting. Uh, it's a fairly, again, a fairly basic example, not my favorite bit of writing, but it does do a good job of explaining it, what I am getting at. Um, however, because I don't want my colorblind friends to hate me, we're going to break this down by section so that you can tell what's bolded. Uh, so here is just everything in bold and color um, is a story thread being advanced. Uh, in this particular case, you know, um, the story of what eventually leads to the creation of the time loop device, which is a major mystery in the game. Um, there are those individual personalities coming into play a bit with Pi and Raimi, who have kind of a friendly rivalry going on. Um, there's also some humor in that hint where they're talking about the door needing to be closed for some time. Haha, <laughs> do you get it? Um, <laughs> I did this to people. Um, so again, uh, the, and also with the rivalry, um, the idea is that it's supposed to be a little bit more fun than just like, hey, we ran an experiment. That is kind of dry in fairness. Um, and it's connecting us to kind of, we're connecting this research that they were running the experiment on to uh, the Ash Twin project, which is kind of the name for the construction of the time loop device, that sort of thing. Um, here's where you would go previously uh, if, if you wanted to go back and figure out what led up to this point, there are those extraordinary findings, and you'll note that we're specifically calling out where you would find those in the world. So you know to go to the White Hole Station, which is a very specific location in the game. Uh, and then we have where you would go next to continue advancing this plot. Um, currently, it can only be accessed from the path in the Sunless City. And we are kind of an exception here to um, the longest branch being the one where it kind of has the most important information. Um, so to kind of mitigate that, I've just gone ahead and put this information in both branches in this particular case. Uh, progression in Outer Wilds admittedly is challenging. It's not impossible, but it is challenging. Um, that last example perhaps notwithstanding, since it was very clear about where to go. We rely a lot on inference. Um, once the player has gathered this information, it's up to them to kind of piece it together and understand what it means in the greater context of the world. We're really not big believers in spelling it out for players. But at the same time, we do need it to be clear enough that the player is able to progress. Um, and it kind of boils down to uh, keeping track of what they've learned should not be the challenging part of piecing the story together. To that end, that's why we have the ship computer work the way it does. That was almost entirely Alex and Lone. So I can't speak too much about it, but um, what it's doing actually is when I wrote, whenever I wrote a piece of Nomai text, I was working from what we had decided that piece of text needed to convey, that absolute most basic piece of information. And that's what we've actually essentially put in the ship log each time. Entries are only ever what we're 100% certain the player knows from reading that text. And that can be really tricky because it's easy to slip into assuming what the player knows. Um, it, helps when I, it helps when I was writing it to remember that for all I know, this is the first piece of text the player has ever found. So you can't make any leaps of logic with it, no inferences. It's just, if I look at this piece of text, I 100% know the player knows this at bare minimum. And that's what we're putting in the ship log. Um, so for narrative, uh, you've probably heard of the whole string of pearls thing, um, or, or the idea that, you know, you're kind of getting X amount of information and then we're hitting a point where we're saying, okay, like we funneled down and now we can definitively say that the player knows this much by this point in the story. We cannot do that for Outer Wilds. Oh, we are a very tangled story structure, my friends. Um, and we had to assume that the player knows any amount and any combination of information at any given time. A zero gating means no funnel points. So I can't check to make sure you know X, Y, Z, because again, you have free reign in the world. We're not, you know, unlocking locations later on. It's all there from the get go. Uh, and it would not be practical <laughs> to account for every possible path that uh, you could take through the know my found text and then tailor all of those paths accordingly to make sure that they're a good player experience, that is the path to madness. Uh, I don't want to go there. Basically, the minimum amount of 
information the player has at any given time when encountering that piece of know my text could be as little as just what they've encountered on the path to get up into space, which is very, very little, uh, all the way up until they might have seen literally everything in the game by now, except the very end. Uh, and there is a lot of space in between those areas. That's actually why having those smaller chunked um, storylines or character arcs, that sort of thing, that's why that's so important. Um, especially the more contained ones, like those localized to a very specific location on, say, a planet. Um, those, one, tell a, a specific story in an area, you're getting kind of that payoff, that structure happening. So you're getting a satisfying little mini experience there. Um, but also what you're learning overall from that particular arc, that can build on other separate arcs in the game. Um, so that regardless of the order in which they're encountered, um, it's still going to produce a reliably satisfying player experience. And it's tricky to do. Part of it is that we're not repeating a lot of information. Um, and we can get away with that because of the time loop, because essentially you will never ever only be able to receive a specific piece of information just the once. Um, so for example, if we're looking at the escape pods, there are three escape pods that launched uh, when the, the Nomai vessel crashed um, in the solar system. And each of them is their own self-contained arc. Um, self-contained is maybe not the quite the right word to use here for how interconnected everything is, but there is a story from when it crashes to kind of when they either uh, find their long-term, they're found their long-term uh, settlement or else die in Dark Bramble. Um, but they're, they're related to one another, but they're all their own arc. They're related to one another because they're all part of the vessel's arrival arc. Uh, and then there's some text there in the vessel itself, for example, um, where the vessel warped into Dark Bramble uh, accidentally because it's an interdimensional nightmare. Um, and then from that, you can also look at uh, escape pods one and two because those are the, the nomai that survived in the long run. Those are the first Nomai settlers in our solar system that are there long term uh, and they do eventually unite. And that's its own separate arc that those smaller arcs are part of. Um, and then on top of that, <laughs> they all relate because they're all how the Nomai arrived in the solar system. And this is just a very small piece of the mystery that we're talking about here. Um, it's all arcs all the way down. And you're looking at these very small pieces that you kind of then build up into these bigger things. And as you can see, some things are, are part of one arc, but not part of another. Um, it, it gets complicated in there, which is again, a hell of a lot of fun if you're a narrative designer. Um, genuinely, it was a blast to make. However, in spite of all of my best efforts, there are still some paths through Outer Wilds that do produce a more satisfying experience than others. And we want to design for that because we want as many people to get that better experience as possible. So we have these levels of content that exist. Um, they're roughly divided into three levels. It's not a hard and fast rule, but essentially any piece of found text in the game uh, falls into one of these three categories more or less. Um, and I'd like to break those levels down because they have a lot to do with physical placement of text. Um, surface level text is going to be the easiest to encounter. Uh, it's often literally on the surface of your planets, your celestial bodies, that sort of thing. Um, they're usually great for helping a player pick up a story thread and following it with fairly minimal effort. Um, it's not necessarily the beginning of a mystery, it's usually a media res but you don't need a ton of specialized information to really understand what's happening. It's not necessarily introducing crazy new terms, that sort of thing. Um, it can be, and often is, ignored by the player in, uh, in favor of literally any piece of surface level text that they find more interesting. Uh, and that is something we want to have happen. If they bounce off of it, that's fine. We just, we want some of these surface level pieces of text to make the player curious enough that they want to pursue that, at least initially. Um, if we're looking at examples specifically on the Hourglass Twins, that piece of text that I broke down earlier about getting into the high energy lab, that's a really good example of surface level text. It's not super hard to parse. Um, 
it's pretty clear what it's talking about. It's very clear how to kind of get to that point from earlier. Um, and it's, it's interesting because we're talking about, you know, some really exciting findings and then it's led to this project being developed. So it's, it's a pretty good entry point for a lot of that uh, time loop related content. Um, Mid-level text, you're going to largely find by following clues. You're a lot less likely to stumble across it. That doesn't mean it's impossible, and it's actually totally fine if uh, players do come across that without following clues to get to that point. Um, this is the stuff that's it's developing our story further. We're getting into some of the more complex details. We're maybe connecting to other mysteries as well. Um, but the, the big thing here is that we're furthering it. We're telling the player kind of where to go to learn more. We're really rewarding exploration at this point. Um, the Sunless City has some content like this, even though maybe that's a little lighter. The mid-level text range is pretty broad in fairness. Um, so it's not too hard to get into the Sunless City. And so the level of, of payoff that you're getting is not too, too great just yet. And then we have hidden text. Now, this is the text where you need to follow clues to get to this point. And it is extremely unlikely to find hidden level text by accident. Um, it's often in a difficult to reach location is why. Um, if you think back to even say um, the, from the start of the talk, that, that example about going into caves and running into sand, you have to learn a fair bit about the environment by this point. And you also have to have put some different know my clues together to get here. Um, you need specific info basically to be able to reach this stuff. And that is because it reveals very valuable stuff about the game's mysteries. Um, answers to mysteries or big conclusions to stories are always at this level. Uh, because we want players to hopefully encounter that after they've kind of built up to that moment. Um, and if you'd like to ask me how we knew which areas were hidden or hard to find, playtesting. <laughs> um, we played the game ourselves. Some places are just inherently harder to get to. And then we playtested the crap out of it. Um, good example, there's a big secret in the center of Ash Twin. Wink. Uh, so if you know what that one is, that's that's the level of you know intense we're talking about. Um, this does mean <laughs> that technically, yes, a first-time player can beat the game in a single time loop. I've never seen it happen, but it's theoretically not impossible. Uh, I'm not willing to say it's impossible because then someone will prove me wrong. Um, it's just extremely unlikely. Basically, all of this design is in place to make sure that that doesn't happen. And we did test a lot for it. I'm not kidding when I said we did a lot of play testing. We had to, to make sure the game could be pieced together um, by the player as they go through it. All of that found text, all putting all the mysteries together. Um, I think the player would honestly have to have some sort of advanced knowledge or context about the game, because even if they did do the specific things you'd have to do on the first loop to, to end the game on that first loop, I don't know that they would have the context necessary to apply that information. But again, willing to be proven wrong. Um, however, we do have this last design goal to go through, so let's do that. Uh, it's rewarding exploration, as you can tell. Basically, um, because again, our big reward in the game is knowledge, hopefully the reward is also, you know, the experience and the journey and the satisfaction of a job well done. But in the more classic sense, perhaps, it's, it's knowledge. And the problem is that if the player starts feeling like their efforts are wasted or they're not getting satisfying results, or even if just they're not getting the answers that they want, um, if they're pursuing a particular mystery thread and we're giving them answers about this other thing, that loop breaks down. And I don't have to tell you why that's a problem. Um, so story becomes really useful for rewarding exploration in this way. Um, the inclusion of smaller arcs are huge The um, because the, the bigger mysteries and questions in the game, they take a lot of time to answer, literally up to the entire game. <laughs> so we have to reward progress as it happens. Um, also, those smaller arcs kind of building up to a point that helps us because uh, if you, you know, if you if you 
play through the first escape pod arc and you you know all of that content and then you play the second it doesn't ruin the second arc and vice versa so those smaller arcs also help us in ensuring that there are still rewards to those mysteries and we're not spoiling things by going out of order because again there's just not a set order um mixing in light-hearted or sillier or, or smaller stories with the massively devastating ones because there are some terrible things that happen to the nomai um, that was big. Managing that tone was really important in writing. Um, because Alex is just, Alex has been super into science. Um, he has, uh, the game always had this idea that failure perhaps isn't failure, so to speak. Um, and what I actually mean by that is the idea that, say, your hypothesis is wrong. That's not failure. It's just that you've, you've now learned information that you can apply toward finding the correct hypothesis. Um, so the Nomai's cultural attitudes very much reflect that. It was just kind of a natural jumping off point. And I think it does help reinforce the idea for the player of uh, failure in the game as progression. Um, failure in this case being death. Uh, when the player dies, a lot of the time they might be doing that in the pursuit of knowledge or they, they're going to learn something from that death, even if it's just put your spacesuit on before you go outside of the ship. Uh, we've all been there. Um, we also have those emotional hooks and payoffs we talked about earlier, and this is where all of that character work really comes into play. Um, while the player reward for discovering new text is always new information, you will always get new information as you get new know my text. Um, I was also at the same time uh, trying to pay off some character arcs and some minor story arcs that maybe weren't related to the massive stakes of the of the grander solar system mysteries. Um, some examples of that, uh, there's a character called Poke that is afraid that she won't be able to successfully recreate this work core, um, and you find that out uh, even though she's been acting quite confident about it the whole time, and eventually it leads to her pulling it off. And that's a really good moment for her. And if I've done my job correctly, it's a good moment for other for the, for the player experiencing that alongside her. Um, Clary and Yarrow are two characters that have an interest in each other initially. And there's some teasing uh, by, I think, Poke in particular teases Clary about this because they're siblings, of course they do. Um, they have an interest in each other and then Clary and Yarrow start dating. And that's kind of a, you know, it's a nice payoff. It's sweet. It's not earth shattering, but it's nice to see. You'll love to see it. Um, Solanum, as a child, you can kind of chart her growth. Um, you can go all the way from her playing children's games in a cave in the Sunless City, um, writing poetry there, being afraid that the eye might be this malevolent force after all. Um, and you can follow her through kind of overcoming some of those fears and eventually her pilgrimage to the quantum moon. So showing these nomai's lives as meaningful as having accomplishments as having positive elements to them i basically because i knew the comet was going to be what it was uh we basically had to get rid of all of the nomai because otherwise they weren't going to leave the solar system without having found the eye that the pursuing their they weren't going to stop pursuing their ultimate goal so um <laughs> we had to kill them <laughs> uh Gosh, please don't quote me on that one. Point being, the, the more we can reward these smaller things, the better that's going to feel. And it's also going to be this nice, you know, reward for following along with the Know My Story. Um, this is your final warning. If you haven't played the game yet, you need to go. <laughs> you need to go do it because we can never come back from this point. Okay? All right. For the rest of you. We're telling multiple stories in Outer Wilds. We're telling the player's story. That's the player experience. We're telling uh, the story of the solar system. And later we kind of realize it's, it's the story of the full universe, in fact, um, with all of that physical stuff that's happening. And that's really entwined with player story to begin with, because those are both happening in the present. And then we have the know my story, which is all happening in the past. These stories are all profoundly related to one another. And it becomes apparent as the player progresses through the game. Um, and the whole thing here is, and this is why it was so damn critical for me to get the player to empathize with the Nomai and be invested in them, is that the Nomai have put in all of this work in the past and thought they failed. And when the universe is ending, 
when the sun dies. And that finally powers this time loop device that they had made, and it gives the player the time that they needed to finish the journey to the eye, to reach the eye. And the player's story occurs in the present, but you're doing it in parallel with the Nomai's journey. You're reliving it. You're making their discoveries with them. You're experiencing their successes and failures. And ultimately, you are building on that, and you are finally finishing that story. And the more I have done my job, the more I have been able to get the player invested in this emotionally, the more satisfying the end of the game is going to be. Because it is that big payoff that you have been working this entire game toward. And I want you to finish this game, not just on behalf of you, but on behalf of all of these characters in the world that helped you get there. All right, let's do takeaways. Y'all like takeaways? Let's do takeaways. Uh, it is amazing to me when story and gameplay can be closely integrated. I want to see us take advantage of that, guys. This is a medium where we're able to do that, and no one else really can. We're not books. We're not cinema. Let's do it. Uh, also, we could not have pulled this off without clear design goals. Um, in that regard, Alex is an absolute wonder. Um, it allowed us to do some really cool stuff with storytelling and create this really unusually cohesive experience. And Indie is a great place to do that. Um, not that you always can mind, but and it's not a shot at AAA either. It's just this is the sort of thing that's hard to pull off on a larger scale, at least from what I've seen. Um, the larger your team is, the harder that gets. And so Indie's in a really good spot to be that level of cohesive. Um, also, we were in a great place to remain flexible and be able to iterate really rapidly and really, really often. And that did a lot for us. Again, not every team can do it, but if you can, I mean, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I'll also point out that um, even though we have an official story team uh, in the credits, which is Alex Lone and me, I would not have been able to do this level of, of writing to pull any of this off uh, without complete studio buy-in. The team really believed in the story and they believed in getting us there. And without them, this could not have happened. So I, I owe them a tremendous amount for pulling that off. Um, it's so critical for me as a writer to have that for my team. I had a lot of success with uh, kind of approaching things mentally as pulling versus pushing information. Please stop telling me why I care. <laughs> Please make me care. I would love that. Um, I love games that do that. It's really wonderful. It goes back to showing and not telling because again, we're games. We're games, you guys. <laughs> don't, don't assign me an objective to care. I won't do it. Um, also, wanted to point out again, it's surprisingly okay to, uh, to have the player maybe not always immediately know what they're doing as long as you're still guiding them a little bit. Don't, you know, throw them in deep water. But I think, honestly, even if we were sweating it a little bit in development at times, thinking, oh boy, like, hopefully players don't get frustrated and give up and all that, um, there's a whole community of Outer Wilds fans who I absolutely adore, we have the best fans, we really do, who have proven that they're willing to put in the time to figure things out for themselves. Players are not dumb. Um, they're going to figure it out, especially if they're having a good time figuring it out. And if we're not penalizing them for dying in the game, you know, if they're not losing items and all that, it's, it really frees things up in a bizarre way. Um, and I guess this is a little bit of my soapbox thing here, but it's my talk. Deal with it. Uh, the games industry is still relatively young, and we are still in our infancy as a storytelling medium. You guys, that is so exciting. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. As somebody that works in narrative, obviously, I'm a bit biased. Um, I'm really excited to see what we what we can do from here. Uh, we're still trying all of this stuff and we're still learning a tremendous amount from it as we go. Um, so, uh, you know, if there's anything you take away from this talk, I really hope that you embrace story and narrative in your games and uh, talk to your writers, see what they can do with you because we're doing some really cool stuff already and it's only gonna get cooler from here. So, to the future. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe that one was a bit much, hey? Um, however, thanks so much for, for watching. Um, I really appreciate it. I hope you learned something fun or at least had a good time. Uh, I've got some people to thank, uh, a lot of people in fairness, but um, E.M. Jacobson is concept artist. 
at Mobius Digital. Uh, I have used some of his images here and I appreciate them immensely. Um, everyone at Mobius Digital was a dream to work with, uh, phenomenal human beings as well, uh, especially Alex and Loan, because I worked a ton with them and they're amazing storytellers and frankly, irritatingly brilliant designers. Um, what can you do? Uh, obviously I should thank my family at this point, uh, my partner, John, and my friend, Dan, for getting me through uh, to this point on my talk, because, you know, <laughs> it was a little bit of a new thing for me. And thank you so much to GDC for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And it's been a genuine pleasure. I hope you all enjoy the rest of GDC. Thanks again. Thank you.